Hello, my name is Marilyn Kitz-Nicholas. Welcome to this session I'm running on crushing customer pain points, five tactics for product growth teams. A little bit about me first though. I've worked in product and marketing teams, specifically on growth for a little bit over 10 years. I have been hugely focused on experimentation and CRO for the past eight years and have worked across global markets. Let's get into it. So what can you learn from this session? Well, this session is going to focus on uncovering five tactics to support customer pain points and alleviating those customer pain points. But let me just start out by saying this. If your customer pain points are not a core focus of your product growth program, then you're kind of missing the point. And if you're asking, well, what's the point? Well, the compound effect of uncovering and addressing your customer pain points is the path to accelerated growth. If we consider some typical focus areas of product growth teams, what comes to mind is optimizing onboarding, upsell and cross-sell, maybe optimizing the sign-up flow and retention as well. However, what I've seen product growth teams focus on, and, and not a diss and not a bad thing, but if we're just focusing on those high value customers and the actions those high value customers take in retention and trying to mimic and trying to create experiences where we can mimic or accelerate those actions from other customers, we're actually not looking at the midpoint. So we've got the customers who perform really well. We've got the customers who maybe are almost out the door on cancellation, which are common focus areas. But what about the midpoint? What about the customers we're missing and those experiences? Here's what I will be covering in this session. First, I will explore a couple of reasons for why you should care about customer pain. And what will follow is a framework for understanding pain points in that, how can we categorize the type of pain points? Next, I will touch on what you need to consider before you start identifying, validating, and addressing customer pain points. And then we'll hop into key tactics you should employ in your product growth program in order to identify, problem solve, and absolutely crush customer pain points. I'll then wrap with some key takeaways. Let's get into it. Why should I care about customer pain points or maybe you're completely not asking that but just wanting to understand why you should really make this a focus of your product growth program and the simplest answer is reduce and prevent churn so reducing and preventing churn is the overall big goal and advantage of making customer pain points a focus for your program but it's really what happens in between that grants us access to high levels of growth. For example, say you release a new collaboration tool for customers or accounts with multiple users. This collaboration feature may be something that was highly requested by customers. It may be something that you have released and you had all the data, data backing it. But in reality, following launch, you have not seen the engagement or the sentiment you expected from your customers. What do you do then? What happens then? So by working to understand if there is a customer pain point or what the customer pain point or friction area is, and knowing then what that root cause is, you can potentially better meet customer expectations, addressing their pain and improving their experience meaning they're going to stay with you for longer and they're going to be more loyal to you in the long run. That in itself has a compound effect. These stats I have on this page, I've taken from Harvard Business Review and PwC's study from 2017, 2018. Essentially, they further support what I'm saying here. Customers are more expensive to acquire than they are to retain. And this can be up to 25% more expensive to acquire than to retain. So wouldn't you wanna focus on the cheaper, more cost-effective tactics for growth? Hi, this is Romo Santiago from Experiment Nation. If you'd like to connect with hundreds of experimenters from around the world, consider joining our Slack channel. You can find the link in the description. Now back to the episode. All right, next we're getting into what 
our customer pain points? Like what kind of customer pain points are we talking about and how can we categorize them? Okay, so we're starting to understand why we may want to address and even focus on user or customer pain points within our product growth program. Then how do we categorize them? How do we start understanding them? And this is gonna be important for tracking later on. So this is why I'm outlining it now. And this is why I think you should find a way in your product growth program to categorize your product and feature related pain points. Here, as an example, I've broken them down by usability, emotional, and process. So your usability pain points will focus on areas of the feature or product that are confusing, maybe confusing interfaces, maybe unclear messaging, unclear error messages specifically come up, difficulty in finding features. Hey, there might not be any issue in particular with a feature, but if your customer can't find it, that's where the blocker is. And also lengthy sign-up processes. Anything like this, this is what comes down to usability pain points, emotional pain points, feeling overwhelmed by information, frustrated by lack of progress. Your customer might be bored by repetitive tasks. Maybe there are too many steps, too many tasks to do the one thing. This can all create negative emotion within the customer. And lastly, I have process here. So this comes down to complex workflows, unclear steps to complete tasks, and sometimes a lack of personalization. Are you asking the customer to do things in the product that don't really relate to them? These are all things that come down to process. Okay. So now that we have a good understanding of a framework and categorization of pain points, let's move on. So whether you are already making customer pain points a focus of your product growth program, maybe within a retention pillar, whether you're doing this or not, it's great to just have a checklist of what you need to have in place before you get started. So here I have tracking and analytics, a given, right? You can't fix what you can't measure. And analytics and tracking are vital, really vital to understanding user behavior, to identifying these pain points and for tracking the effectiveness of your solutions. It's a given. And an example of this is you know, we want to track user drop off points in a sign up process. We want to be able to analyze every single click in that process. We want to make sure that we have heat maps. The next area you're going to want to have in check is goals. Have clear goals so you can so you can prioritize these pain points and measure the impact of your solutions. Are you aiming to improve sign-up completion, completion rates? Are you looking to reduce customer support tickets or increase user engagement? And a consideration here is to align feature and team goals with overall product team goals where possible. And the next thing you wanna check off your list and something that you've probably seen in the experiment design plan is the notion of guardrails. And really what this is looking at is identifying potential risks associated with addressing the pain points. So you wanna make informed decisions and avoid unintended consequences. Uh, an example here, you know, consider potential impact on existing users of a major interface redesign. Explore the risk of losing functionality in that redesign when you're you know, going out to simplify something, are you actually removing functionality and causing frustration for that user? This happens, it's something to be mindful of. So just understand what your guardrails are in relation to your growth program and the areas of focus. We've made it. We've made it to the five tactics to crush customer pain points. And these might be things you're already doing. And if you are, that's excellent. I'm gonna to touch on all of these and maybe you'll discover something new, learn something new, 
or just feel validated in what you're already doing in your program. And that's great. So what we'll cover is customer listening, customer feedback, feature flags, uh, controlled experiments or A-B testing and session recordings. Let's go. I'm using customer listening here as a slightly broad term because customer listening does include social listening, KPI performance or data and analytics and customer success data and NPS. So diving into social listening a little bit more, um, I think this is a great way to listen to customers, mainly through social media. So social media platforms, forums, whether it's external to your product um, or a forum that's associated with your product, even um, app store reviews, all these areas can provide you with very val valuable information and feedback from your customer. And most often very, very honest and candid feedback from your customers. So we do see users get quite passionate in the comments, whether from like elation, finally they released that feature or disappointment. Oh, they released that feature, but it's not what I wanted. Or, or oh, when are they gonna finally release that feature? Or like, what is going on with XYZ? This is where you're going to find the most emotional, maybe even loyal customers speaking up about your product and features. Next up is performance metrics or KPIs. For example, let's say your high value customers breeze through a specific task in a minute. And you can see this through segmentation and through your metrics in your product analytics tool. But when you when you break it down a little bit more and when you're looking at other customer segments, you see that there are a bunch of users who are taking four to five minutes to complete this task. Mm. Something's not right there. So make sure that you're really digging into the data, especially as it pertains to newer features. Next up, we have customer success data and MPS. OK, so let's never forget the amazing insights your customer success team can provide. If you don't have a customer success team, this is maybe something you can do on your own, your own, but assuming you do have a customer success team, let's think about their roles. They are on the front lines talking to users every day. So if they're seeing a spike in support tickets about a particular feature, um, you know, maybe it's part of the checkout process, there is a valuable clue just right there that there may be some pain point going on for your customers within your product. Building a strong relationship with this team is absolutely vital. They're going to help you connect the dots and develop real empathy for your customers. I strongly recommend if you're not already talking um, on like a weekly or bi-weekly basis with your customer success team, you should get on that. Okay, so if you think about customer listening, this is about looking for the nuggets of gold, trying to piece together the puzzle in understanding where you should be focusing and where there might be customer pain points, where you can improve in your product or in particular features. But you may not have enough data or points of validation to start forming a solution or to even really know if this is an actual issue or a larger enough issue for you and your team to prioritize. So what are you going to do? You're going to seek customer feedback, right? So examples of this are surveys, stop customer interviews. Okay. Customer interviews, you can go so in depth. You can ask so many questions. This is just, it comes down to a time factor and the fact that you're talking to maybe a handful of customers. So there is going to be a smaller sample here and you really need to be careful and have pretty much already validated that you do have a user pain point that you do have a problem that you will need to solve for you're going to need to have that in a really good place and really believe in it probably before you invest that time into the customer interviews but once you have and you do get into those conversations you are going to start to learn more about what is going on and how you can solve for that User testing will help you throughout this entire process. It will help you when you're trying to validate whether something's an issue with either your own customers or 
a sample size of the population. And following from there, once you're at the point where you do have some design proposals for an alternate experience, you can, again, take that to user testing with existing customers or a sample group. And you can really start to understand whether this, ex this new experience that you're proposing is an improved experience upon the, on the ladder. And on top of that, you're gaining both qualitative and quantitative insights, depending on the way that you structure your user, your user testing research. Feature flags. Now, it's probably a given that most product teams are utilizing feature flags. But just as a recap, these are like little switches you can use within your code, allowing you to control rollout do anything with any part of the feature. They are fantastic and we use these to mitigate risks. We use these to run slow rollouts to test against the existing experience with different audiences and segments. These are vital to your product growth and probably product program in general. This is an absolute necessity in any product growth program. So following some initial user testing on maybe some new prototypes and a successful rollout through feature flags, you may, you know, you may, may now be more clear on what's going to work. But there may be some other designs you were working on in this whole process. And we're not going to just let those designs go to waste. We're going to iterate. We're going to optimize that experience and run follow-up A-B tests. And from there, we can reach optimal growth. And finally, the fifth tactic I have here is session recordings. Okay, so there are, there are three benefits I've outlined here for session recordings. We're, we're able to uncover hidden friction points. We're able to measure the, measure the impact of the change, and we're able to build empathy for our users. So when thinking about uncovering hidden friction points, Sometimes user surveys and interviews might not reveal the full picture. Session recordings can expose those subtle frustrations users might not even be aware of. Like for example, you might see users getting stuck on a specific element on a page, maybe hovering over a button, not realizing something might be a button, um, or maybe even taking unexpectedly like way too long to complete a task. So these recordings highlight areas where the user interface might be confusing or the user flow might need improvements. These might be things that the customer, again, doesn't even realize, but you can see it in the, in the data and you can see it when you watch their recording. The next benefit I have here is measure the impact of changes. So once you've identified a pain point, you can use the session recordings to measure the effectiveness of your solutions. Let's say you observed users struggling to find a particular feature in previous recordings. Well, after implementing a more prominent search bar, just say it was around search, you can use new recordings to see if users can now easily locate that feature. This visually confirms and helps to validate the success of uh, the implemented solution. Sometimes we, we think we've been successful in our implementation um, through testing, you know, the metrics say it all. And yes, they do, but we want to understand also why, or we want to understand if we've seen it because they're not doing that thing they were doing before. So we can really measure the impact of these changes through the session recordings. But before you leave this session, please take away the following you need to build a strong feedback loop. Effective growth starts with listening to your customers. Combine customer listening techniques like social media analysis, performance metrics, your product data analytics, all of that. Combine everything, gather it, and understand the picture of what's happening. Data-driven decision-making. Our opinions do not matter. Always lean on the data to inform your decision, to inform the prioritization of areas within your product growth program, and empathy and iteration. Throughout this process, cultivate empathy for the user. They're the ones you're, they're the ones you're touching with the changes you make in your product. So make sure you understand them to the nth degree. 
Techniques like session recordings can help you see their struggles and using empathy to guide your solutions and then continuously iterate based on the results of the A-B tests you run will be the sure way to grow. Thank you for listening today. It's been a pleasure running this session for Experiment Nation. I wish you all the best with your product growth programs. If you do want to get in touch, if you want to discuss any of these tactics in more detail or discuss experimentation, please contact me on LinkedIn and I will respond as soon as I can. Hi, this is Romo Santiago from Experiment Nation. If you'd like to connect with hundreds of experimenters from around the world, consider joining our Slack channel. You can find the link in the description.